Joining me is Craig Smith. He is the chairman of Swiss America, author of the new book, The Great Debasement. And you can find out more at SwissAmerica.com. Craig, I was just reading some of your notes that were sent to me that you say a second President Obama term is going to be bad for the economy. Make the case for why. Well, because we're not seeing any changes, David. The, we did not have a liquidity problem in 2009, 2010, 2011. We had a confidence problem. Most businesses are sitting on record reserves right now, but are very fear, fearful to invest them in the market because we don't know what's going to happen next in Washington. And just by way of history, we all probably remember in 2010 uh, when we passed the stimulus and we passed Obamacare and nobody knew what was in the bill. Then 2011, we had the big fight to raise the de debt ceiling. That's where we came up with the sequester and all. Everybody was terrified that we were going to go off the cliff. Uh, at that moment. And now today we're dealing with the fiscal cliff again. And Mr. Obama is very intransigent about raising taxes on the top 2% Americans. And the Republicans are intransigent trying to stop him. So we have a confidence problem, David. When you're running a business and you have thousands of pages of health care bills to go through to see how it will affect your business, when you have regulations coming out of Dodd-Frank that are unprecedented, along with Basel III changes that are coming for reserve requirements, how does a businessman plan for that, David? It's so difficult to do it. So we have a confidence problem. And I don't think that confidence problem is going to be changed by another four years of the Obama administration. We argue that there's been a 25% drag on the economy due to Mr. Obama, and not due to him personally, just the fact that he is following a failed ideology that's never worked economically throughout the world. So, so talk we don't about see that. that let's, let's talk about that specifically. What has he done in the first four years that have created this 25% drag? Well, l let's give a perfect example. The first year he took office, 2009, he said, we are not going to allow the Bush tax cuts to be extended. By the last month of 2009, going into 2010, he, with his own words, said the economy's too weak to not extend them. So he extended the Bush tax cuts, but he said, that's it. Okay, well, that's good. That's a good, good, good plan. At least we wouldn't have gone back into a recession. Now, we have a softer economy today, David, than we had in December of 2009. And he's saying, well, I'm not going to extend them this time. We're going to definitely let them expire. He says he wants to give confidence to the middle class. That's wonderful by not increasing their taxes. But you're not giving confidence to corporations and wealthy people who have their money invested in small businesses to know what's going to happen with their taxes. So every time you create an uncertainty like that, investment and markets hate uncertainty and we're going to continue to have that uncertainty david well i don't know about that because let's talk about let's talk about the minutia there a little bit if you do increase taxes on the wealthiest americans we're not talking about the corporate tax rate here we're talking about the personal the, the top marginal income tax on the wealthiest americans that's not going to have a a negative effect on the economy because those are people that are all they're still going to be able to afford the same houses the same cars they're not going to buy any less food so on and so forth so i actually agree that separating the bush tax cuts as one large thing Thing into the tax cuts for the richest people and the middle class tax cut makes sense because the middle class tax cut will be stimulative. That money will be spent. The rich will save that money. Well, well, let, let's analyze that. Yeah. First off, 50, 54 percent of people that make over two hundred thousand dollars a year are filing their taxes as small businesses, as private individuals. That's how I did it 30 years ago when I started my firm. So let's make sure that we we're not just talking about rich. You're absolutely right. Rich people are not going to be are not going to be affected by a 4% increase in their taxes. Glad quite, we agree. quite frankly, it's going to be irrelevant to them. Exactly. But it's going to mean less money in their private pockets that, as you say, could be saved, which goes into banks, then is allowed to be lent out to create an economy. Okay, let's stop there, though. When, let's stop when, there when for we, a second. We have to stop there for a second, though, because we have to compare what is the stimulative effect of a rich person putting that money in the bank and then the jobs that creates in banking versus, for example, and, and I know you, a lot of people don't like this example, food stamps, which is known to have an exponentially higher multiplier effect because that money is absolutely going to be spent. That is then goes to a supermarket, that goes to the supplier, so on and so forth. So the stimulative effect is way lower of the savings. Wait a minute, David, you've fallen, fallen into the typical misunderstanding of food stamps that was presented by Nancy Pelosi. Okay, <laughs> she said those people spend it right away. You act as though this money is coming from somewhere. We have to borrow that money, David. If you took, if you raise taxes on the rich 
a hundred percent, you're still not going to have enough money to make everything work. But let's say we do do it for 4% and it generates $80 billion. Okay. Okay, we're now spending between food stamps, Title VIII, and Medicaid a trillion dollars a year, David. So will it have any negative impact on the market? I believe it will. One thing I can assure you, it will have no positive impact on the market. Let's talk about what could have a positive impact. Let's put taxes to the side for a minute. Yeah. Let's just say you're right. And I'll stipulate that we can raise taxes on the wealthy. Okay, do it for five years so there's certainty. Now at the same time say we're going to cut entitlement spending, not against the baseline, but real cuts, meaning if we spent a trillion dollars this year, we're only going to spend $900 billion next year with legitimate cuts and hold them for five years, then say you are going to suspend the unknown regulations that are coming from Obamacare, which now Denny's is gonna be charging a 5% surtax on each bill that they have and putting people in a part-time status so they don't have to pay them benefits. Yeah, but that's the same Papa John's pizza nonsense. The reality is that business hiring really depends on demand and demand will be stimulated by middle and lower income people being able to afford your product. Product. So the idea, the, the simple economic concept of, of marginal revenue tells us that you would make hiring decisions based on supply and demand from your customers. Uh, that, that this is where I feel people are getting totally mixed up. Okay, but David, fair enough. If you go to a college, that's what you're going to read in a textbook. I started this company 31 years ago with $50 out of the bedroom of my home. We now build $250 million a year. So I think I have a little experience in how you create demand. You don't have to wait for demand to come. You can go out and create the demand. Okay. And that's, and that's the problem. We have this belief, David, that there's only one pie. And so then why doesn't any... Denny's create more demand, regardless of what the government does? Because they don't know what their costs are going to be on Obamacare. <laughs> they don't know if tomorrow the FDA is going to come out with a new regulation that turns around and says that they're not going to be able to serve fatty foods or salty foods or 16-ounce drinks. I mean, David, all those regulations have an effect. And look, I'm not blaming all this on Mr. Obama. Let's, well, let's, let's take back. a step back then, because I, I want to step back from Obama just for a second, because a lot of times, a lot of the arguments you're making are made specifically when it's Democrats in office. And I ran some numbers, and I saw that stock, re stock market returns are so much higher over the last 80 years when we've had Democratic presidents than when we've had Republican presidents. Domestic industrial production has increased significantly every time there's a Democratic president and has actually decreased slightly when we have Republican presidents. On 11 of 12 economic indicators, the economy does far better under Democratic than Republican presidents. Whoa, 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 whoa. You just made a terrible mistake. Okay. You said the stock market did better. The stock market is not the economy, David. I understand. I'm Those giving are, you a you, Well, there's a number of indicators we, here. Uh, that's one we, of 12. Okay. You have production. That doesn't trickle down always to profit. Many okay. corporations. Okay. So let's keep going, though. You're into, I mean, growth in personal disposable income after taxes, growth. 2.92% annualized under Democratic presidents, 0.53% under Republicans. Every I, indicator, I guess you're Craig, leaving out the last indicator. four years then, because under the last four years, the average American's income middle class has gone down $4,300. So apparently you're conveniently leaving out the last four I'm years. I'm including them. We're averaging this out over the last 80 years. And remember, President Obama was trying to recover from a horrible economic situation left to him by George W. Bush. Oh, yes. Horrible. No, no worse than what Reagan inherited. And Reagan was well on our way to growth right now. Yes, he increased deficits, but so did Mr. Obama. He took us up from 10 trillion to 16 trillion. And again, I, look, I'm not blaming Mr. Obama. Let me make something very clear, David, because I think you and I agree on more than we disagree. Maybe. George, George Bush, while he kept this country safe, was a horrible president from a fiscal responsibility standpoint. Absolutely. He, ne he never had the guts to take a veto pen out and say, no, I'm not going to allow that spending to occur. Yeah. So you're not going to find a big fan, a fiscal fan of George Bush and this fella here. Okay. But, 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 but I can tell you that whether it was under uh, uh, John F. Kennedy or whether it was under Ronald Reagan or quite frankly, whether it was under the first few years of George Bush, tax cuts work. We might not like the net effects of them, but they work. We don't have an income problem in Washington, D.C. David, we have a spending problem. Everybody doesn't want to talk about the 900-pound gorilla in the room, and that's entitlements. And look, you and I would agree on this. Is it fair to say to a Social Security person that's paid in money every year that they're going to have to have their benefits cut? 
Of course not. They've paid that money in, correct? Yeah. But people pay their money into Bernie Madoff. Bernie Madoff was a crook. He stole the money. He's <laughs> well, in we're getting a little bit into the weeds here. We're getting a little bit. I, I, this well, is a long discussion. In consideration, it's David. a long discussion, and I apologize. We don't have more time. The last okay. number I want to leave you with, Craig, is this growth of corporate after tax profit, meaning it takes into consideration the so-called high taxes under Democrats, 4.53 right. percent annualized growth of corporate after tax profit under Democrats an 11.6% decrease annualized of after-tax profit under Republicans. Well, We've got to look at the numbers, Craig. We've got to be well, aware Dave, of that. Dave, David, David, okay, let's, let's take a bigger window then. Let's go over the last 150 years and run those numbers, and we can distort the numbers. But what always matters, the, ma the numbers don't matter. Oh, they don't. How is the, aver how is the average American being affected, David? Well, that's what, what the numbers tell us. How can we say the numbers don't matter? Th the numbers David, are all that matter. David, then Mr. Obama should have won in a landslide instead of a very close election if he's done such a magnificent job running the he economy. He did. He won by more than 100 electoral votes. He won every minority group. He won women he won 55 by, to he 45. He won by 2%, David. Oh, come on, this Craig. He won, in a, he won by way more than George W. Bush did in 2004. Okay. I, I, I can, I, wait a minute. Hold, hold, hold on a minute now. Mr. Obama got less votes in 2012 than he got in 2008, and Mr. Romney got less votes in 2012 than Mr. McCain got in 2008. Okay, so let's not kid ourselves. Why didn't we go to a fully Democratic Congress then? then because of uh, gerrymandering and redistricting. We know why. Okay. I, I, you know, I... I you don't like my answers, Craig, politically. but I have everything, answers. That's the thing. David, you see everything politically, and I can tell you this, okay? <laughs> Good politics make bad economics, and good economics make bad politics. We've and got we to, to look at the numbers. Whether we want to deal with economics or politics, <laughs> we have a financial mess, not just because of Mr. Right. <laughs> Are you We're having, and, and Craig, I don't mean, your, your mic is cutting in and out, and we've reached the end of our time. So we'll have you back. I know there's more to discuss. I want to tell people, if they want a free copy of your new book, The Great Debasement, just call 800 289 2646. You'll send them out a free copy. Craig Smith, chairman of Swiss America. Thanks as always, Craig. David, I appreciate you doing your homework. You're a very well prepared host, and I look forward to future dialogue.